something beside me A light to the kerosene And the places aren't real anymore And the faces don't say anything Welcome to Devil's Chess Club. I'm Aaron Good, and I'm excited today that we have a special episode featuring Gary Vogler and retired U.S. Army Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, who wrote the foreword to Gary Vogler's book. Uh, we're going to be discussing that excellent book today. It is entitled, Israel, Winner of the 2003 Iraq Oil War, Undue Influence, Deceptions, and the Neocon Energy Agenda. Um, as I said, Colonel Wilkerson did write the foreword to this book, and he put me in touch with Gary Vogler. I can't think of two better Iraq War insiders that we could be discussing these issues with, and uh, viewers may want to go back and watch two previous episodes that we did, um, a few, starting a few episodes back, uh, on uh, Gary Vogler's book. I am here today with Gary Vogler uh, and Lawrence Wilkerson. Some of you all would remember Gary Vogler as the author of uh, this book on the... Uh, on Here it is. Here are his two books, uh, Iraq and the Politics of Oil, An Insider's Perspective, and the one that I covered in detail, Israel, winner of the 2003 Iraq Oil War. Also with us is Lawrence Wilkerson, who wrote the foreword to Israel, winner of the oil war war in Iraq. Um, and this is, uh, I'm really excited to have you all together. Gary Vogler, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. And, and thank you to Larry for joining us. Larry's been uh, a key advisor in, in, uh, and, uh, and I've gotten to know Larry quite well in the last, uh, I don't know, six, seven years since we both went on the Rachel Maddow show back in 2014. And we argued an issue on on the opposite ends, and I realized after that that he was right and, and I was wrong. Uh, so, the uh, my two books cover that. Um, did you want me to start with the... Well, that's funny that you mentioned that because I was going to, I guess my first question, also, Larry, it's great to see you again. Yeah, good to see you. Um, my first question uh, is, Per, for you, uh, Gary Vogler, is can you tell us about your background in the military and oil industry and, and your positions vis-a-vis -vis Iraq uh, before and after the invasion, just to give people a, a sense of who you are in case they missed the review, the book review episodes? Sure, I'd be happy. The, uh, well, I went to West Point, uh, graduated in 1973, spent a few years at Fort Bragg in an airborne unit uh, and in Germany. Uh, before getting out of the Army and joining Mobile Oil Corporation in Texas. Uh, spent some time in Texas and then to Saudi Arabia for four and a half years. Came back to the corporate headquarters here in Fairfax, Virginia uh, until 2002. Uh, I, Exxon bought us uh, in 1999 and I, I was one of the last mobile executives to leave the corporation under the old um, uh, golden parachute, if you will. Uh, I left in February 2002. I did nothing for six or seven months, and then I got a call from my Army Reserve unit. Even though I got out of the Army in 1981, I stayed in the Army Reserves. And I got a call from my Army Reserve unit, the U.S. Corps of Engineers in uh, D.C., and they asked me to go to the uh, Pentagon and interview for a job in OSD. And I said, yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, they said it was a short job, only a couple of months. And I said, I had one question, and they said, what's that? And I said, what's OSD? Uh, and uh, I quickly learned that it was the Office of the Secretary of Defense for Policy under Doug Feith. And I went over there in, in uh, October 2002, interviewed, started work the next day, uh, because we were putting together a pre-war oil planning, uh, uh, planning cell for 
what was the Iraq war. Uh, and there were uh, people being assigned to that cell from throughout the government. It was an interagency planning cell. Uh, we had a person from the State Department. Uh, she had worked in the, the Near East Asia Bureau for over 10 years. Uh, we had a uh, highly qualified individual from the Department of Energy uh, who had been an Army officer, a major, during the first Gulf War. Uh, we had a guy from the CIA, uh, and uh, and it was it was a good planning team. And then we uh, uh, we morphed into a team that uh, joined Jay Garner as we went into Iraq. Uh, and uh, when we got out into Iraq, I was the senior oil advisor, uh, first guy to enter the uh, Ministry of Oil headquarters, first civilian to enter the Ministry of Oil headquarters. And in fact, I was for the first 10, my first 10 days in, in Iraq, I was the minister of oil. Uh, and then on May 3rd, 2003, I appointed a gentleman by the name of Thomer Godbon uh, to be the essentially the Iraqi minister of oil. Uh, and then I stayed in Iraq uh, throughout the CPA, the Coalition Provisional Authority for until uh, 2004, July 2004. I took a couple years off. I was mentally and physically exhausted at that point. And then I went back uh, for five years as a contractor working for the U.S. forces as their senior uh, oil consultant uh, uh, there in Baghdad. And I stayed until the end of 2011. And since then, I've been back in re retirement. Well, you've been productive in your retirement writing these illuminating books. I confess I've only read part of the first book, but the second one, as my viewers know, I spent two episodes really kind of meticulously summarizing and responding to. Now, your your position changed over the years, and Larry, can you reflect on your your earlier meetings with, with Gary and the, the disagreements that you had about the uh, Iraq war? I don't. I, it, it wasn't a violent disagreement. Um, there were a lot of things that were happening, and since I was teaching it as a case study at William and Mary, and some really good students, and also at the George Washington University, to equally good students, all in the honors program, had to maintain a almost a. I think it was three point seven five GPA through three years just to get into the program. Talented students, and they all came to the same conclusion that there were at least half a dozen, if not more, reasons that we went to war in Iraq, and none of them made a whole lot of sense except to the individuals who were pushing those reasons, those particular reasons. And they raised a the gamut from anger of the president at an attempt to kill his father by Saddam Hussein to oil. But the one that permeated all the reasons and that all my students would nod their head at, you know, and say, yeah, that had something to do with the decision to go to war, oil. That was the one that sort of went through them all. Um, and so I had this background of more than 400 students on two campuses doing really rigorous case study analysis and then presenting it to the rest of the seminar. And the last hour of that session was the seminar taking them apart, you know, try, trying to find holes in their analysis to back me up in terms of all the reasons that we probably went to war. But the overriding reason, and, and Dennis Fritz, the other author we referred to, or maybe Gary, might disagree with this a bit, was the inexperienced president. So that all these different entities, to include Israel and Mossad, could play on him. They played on him through the Stradivarius Dick Cheney and his crew. And so I, I have a hard time, as I used to tell Powell, blaming the president of the United States other than for being stupid. Um, not stupid in the sense of being dumb. He wasn't a dumb man. He was a sm pretty smart man. But he was stupid in the sense that he let the vice president lead him around for four years like a bull with a ring in his nose. And that was very frustrating for my boss, too. But that's what I had come to the conclusion of. Man, there was a lot of reasons for our having gone to war, none of which made sense in the collective field of national security, but each of which made sense for these poisonous individuals who were pushing the reasons right and you and uh, gary met on uh had you met but with the rachel maddow documentary what was the difference yeah. in the in interpretation of iraq the iraq war back uh, in that time well i'll let gary explain that okay they're, they're good well 
Yeah, we the way they did that documentary is is I was interviewed in the summer of 2013. I think it aired in March of 2014. I don't know when Larry was interviewed, but I got a call from I didn't want to go on. Uh, but I got a call from Ambassador Bremer. He said, Gary, come on, you got to go with me. You know, there are pe people that are saying that it was all about oil. And I said, sir, I don't want to go on there. You know, I, I'm kind of a camera shy type of guy. Uh, he said, no, you got, I said, sir, if you want me, I will. So, so I went on, my position was, and it had been up until that point and, and a year after that, that there was no oil agenda to that war. I believed I believe Feith and Wolfowitz and, and Rumsfeld when they said that there was no oil agenda. Actually, you know, I was naive. I believe those guys. Uh, uh, but the uh, so when we went on this this thing, I, I went on. I said, hey, I couldn't find an oil agenda to the war. But in my and uh, in, in what I was thinking about was an agenda that the press was talking about where Bush and Cheney were talking to senior oil executives in the U.S. oil industry, uh, you know, and I would tell people and I and I told uh, people from the Wall Street Journal back in 2003, I said, hey, I Exxon Mobil had nothing to do with my appointment to this this position I'm in. In fact, they didn't even know about it until I was in Kuwait and there was an article written by Chip Cummins of the Wall Street Journal and and they all sent me emails saying, Gary, what are you doing? You're crazy being over there. But anyway, for the next five or six or seven years, I denied the fact that there was any oil agenda uh, at a low altitude like that, where it was actually deals being made between uh, the administration and senior and oil executives. Um, so I was at a very low altitude uh, looking at things. I think Larry was looking at a very high altitude at a strategic level and the importance of oil to Iraq and to the world. Uh, and so when we went on the Rachel Maddow show, you know, I took the position that there was no oil agenda. Now, one thing I did do when I went on the Rachel Maddow show, I did some research and, and, and I threw out the question to them. It was a three hour interview and they kept pinging me. They said, there's got to be some agenda. I said, the only thing that might be out there, and I said, I've just come across this here uh, recently, is this uh, uh, Kirkuk to Haifa pipeline. I said, if there's anything you should be investigating, it should be that if you're really looking for an oil agenda. And uh, well, they totally dismissed that. They didn't want to go after that. Uh, did, they, did they include it in the documentary? They did not, not, did not include it in the documentary. I called and complained to them about censoring that out. And what they did is they, they put an outtake in their website uh, of me telling the story about the Haifa pipeline. And that's the only thing they did for me. Wow. Uh, yeah, that, cause that, that's oh, an important uh, aspect of this. And maybe uh, maybe this is a time to ask this. Uh, I think, as good as any, where has Israel gotten its oil over the years? Um, I think that your book lays this out and really uh, explains this in a way that I, it, it's very clarifying to me. So maybe you could summarize this because it's, uh, it's, it's really amazing. Yeah. Energy security for Israel has been extremely important to both Israel and the United States uh, since the, you go back to the 1960s. Uh, back then, the, the Shah of Iran was, was the main supplier of uh, oil to, to Israel. Uh, in fact, they, they, they came to an agreement to, uh, and they kept it very confidential. The ag agreement was very, very secretive, uh, that the, uh, uh, they would build a pipeline from Elat, Israel, to Ashkelon, Israel, about a 42-inch 40, pipeline that would carry about a million barrels a day, could carry a million barrels a day. And that was, it was known as the Alad Ashkelon Pipeline Company, EAPC. Uh, and uh, that was constructed in 1969, 1970. And, and that, that was the main supplier of uh, Israel's oil uh, from 1970 until essentially 1995. Uh, there was a brief um, in interruption in 1979 because of the revolution, but a gentleman by the name of Mark Rich, who was the key uh, broker in, in a lot of this oil that came out of uh, Iran and went to Israel, 
he was the one that kept that oil flowing, even at a time when, um, uh, during the revolution, when, when things were in turmoil. Uh, the, uh, and, and Israel essentially confiscated the pipeline after that and kept it open uh, for their own use. Uh, and so- They never paid, they never paid Iran for that. No, they never paid. In fact, there was a arbitration case uh, a few, well, probably six, seven years ago now that uh, said they owed Iran over a billion dollars for that pipeline, but Iran's never going to be able to get that money. Uh, but the, uh, um, so yeah, the, Iran was the primary source of oil. And in fact, Mark Rich supplied as much as 90% of, of Israel's oil uh, until about 19, beginning of 1995. Uh, his company, Mark Rich AG, was a uh, company, a brokerage company located in Switzerland. Even though he was, he was an American, uh, he, his company uh, dealt with all these, these countries that the U.S. had sanctions with. In fact, every time the U.S. would levy sanctions against a, a new country, uh, he saw it as an opportunity to make more money, and he did. Uh, he capitalized on it, and and uh, so uh, he did business with uh, Iran, uh, Cuba, uh, Angola, all the uh, all the uh, countries that the U.S. levied sanctions with. But when he he he, he uh, Mark got a little bit greedy, and he he got off into other commodities besides oil, uh, and he tried to corner. I think it was the zinc market in the early 1990s uh, and he lost his shirt, uh, lost uh, close to 200 million, I think. Uh, and the, uh, so he had to uh, sell out his interest in Mark Rich AG and uh, several uh, investors from uh, London and elsewhere came in to bail out the company. They renamed it to Glencore uh, Commodities, uh, which to, is still in existence today, but it's, it's essentially everyone that marked, worked for Mark uh, back uh, before 1995 uh, worked for Glencore. And then there was another, there's another company out there called Trafigura. And Trafigura is just a, a twin of Glencore. It had broken away from Mark in the earlier 1990s, I think 1992, but they do essentially the same thing. Both of those companies are, are um, primarily Israeli uh, the, uh, uh, Glencore is, is a publicly traded company today, which gives them a lot of, uh, flexibility in the uh, capital markets to do a lot of things, uh, that they were not able to do when it was a privately held company. Uh, but the, uh, Glencore, uh, after 1995, they, they lost, they lost access to Iranian crude oil. So they went out to try to get crude oil wherever they could. Uh, and, and, and the places they got it were primarily Russia. Uh, but what Israel found is that they were paying a 25% premium for their crude oil after 1995 versus, uh, what they paid before that. And so there was a, a huge incentive to take, you know, they, they had lo essentially lost their energy security at that point because they, they were getting oil from anywhere they could get it at the lowest price they could get it. Uh, and, and Glencore and Trafigura played key roles in, in, in uh, that operation. Uh, and then, um, well, during the oil for food program, Glencore would, would get some oil from, from Iraq. Uh, but as you had mentioned a little bit before, they, they were par part of the, the brokers that uh, paid a, a nice uh, uh, premium uh, um, uh, what a, what a, what's the bribe? For, yeah, there you go. <laughs> bribe, right? <laughs> um, yeah. So, so that happened until October of 2003, when we went in uh, to to Iraq. You know, that well, the the what what I learned years later was that uh, uh, when we set up the uh, the oil ministry, and and we worked with the Iraqis on who they would sell their oil to. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Phil Carroll that I mentioned in the book was the retired CEO from Shell US and a retired chairman from uh, Fleur. He and I and a gentleman by the name of Muhammad Al-Jabouri 
we came to the decision along with Ambassador Bremer that we would only sell Iraqi crude while the US was there to large companies that had refineries. And that way that would minimize the, uh, the potential of, of corruption. And, and Muhammad al-Jabouri was 100% behind that, that decision. He was a strong supporter of that because he saw all the corruption that was taking place before we, we entered uh, Iraq and saw how it was impacting the Ministry of Oil and specifically his marketing organization. Uh, and so he, he, uh, he supported that, 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 uh, that policy. And then when Ahmed Chalabi, I may be getting ahead of myself in this story, but Ahmed Chalabi was appointed as the, uh, the head of the governing council in, I think it was Sept October, no, August, September of 2003. And Ahmed was key in, in appointing the new oil minister. Uh, and uh, the new oil minister was part of Ahmed's team. Well, Ahmed had made a promise to the Israel lobby in the United States that he would get oil to uh, to Israel before the end of 2003. And in his first plan, the first plan was that they would reopen the old, an old pipeline from night that was built in 1934. It was called the Kirkuk to, to Haifa pipeline. Uh, that, that pipeline was a small pipeline built in 1934. It was the first export pipeline out of Iraq uh, and it operated from 1934 until uh, 1948, and it was operated. Yeah, there's by a, there's a. Uh, just to interrupt here for one second, people can see it on this map. It's the middle one, and it goes uh, through Homs uh, to uh, uh, the Lebanese. It's it that it says it looks Syrian, but is it is it in Syria or Lebanon where it exits on the coast? I thought it was Lebanon, but as from memory, but it looks you can't really tell on the map here. But the point is. You can, you can see this here. It passes through Syria and comes out on the Mediterranean. Well, that the one through Syria was not, was not. Oh, sorry, by... sorry. Yeah, you're right. I'm we're talking about the Haifa one. The, yes. This, this, this other one is this other one comes into the story later. Yeah. Apologies. This one goes from Haifa on the coast of Israel. Yeah. 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 yeah the one that goes to Haifa. Yeah. That that goes to what is now Anbar Province in Iraq through um, Jordan and then to to Israel to Haifa. Uh, and back in 1934, that was all under the old British uh, protectorate. And so the, the company that built it for, the, uh, for Iraq was the old IPC organization, the Iraq Petroleum Company. And the Iraq Petroleum Company was owned by uh, the, current, the current names are BP, Shell, Exxon, Mobil, and Trafig or, uh, Total of France. Uh, so those companies are IPC uh, had the, the full concession of oil production in Iraq. So they ran that pipeline in 1934. It supplied oil to the refineries in Haifa, and they in turn uh, supplied uh, finished products to the, for the war effort. Um, and that, that ran until 1948 when the king of Iraq stepped in, told IPC, you're not, you're not gonna send your oil to, to this new country of Israel. And so IPC had to figure out a new route to the Mediterranean. And that's when in 1952, they completed the pipeline to uh, Benias, uh, Syria. And uh, that was a, a bigger pipeline than, than the one to, to, uh, uh, to Israel. It operated right. from 1952 until it, it, was, it was damaged during 1991, during the first Gulf War. But then uh, in April of 2003, at the orders of Paul Wolfowitz, it was destroyed by the U.S. forces when we went into uh, into Iraq. Uh, How would that have not damaged the potential Haifa pipeline route? Because I'm looking on this map, and by the way, I, I have kind of pipelines in the in the brain a bit. But I, I've interviewed Charlotte Dennett, and she has many of these same maps and talks about some of these same pipelines. And there's another one I, I think that isn't on here that she discusses that was relevant to around the time the Haifa pipeline was created or the immediate post-World War II era that doesn't that does go through Lebanon but that one doesn't seem to factor in here um but but how would this uh, if you destroy this pump station in April 2003 how wouldn't that have weren't they still interested in the Haifa pipeline how would that have not damaged the or or was the idea just to prevent the reestablishment of oil going through there, and then you would eventually repair it 
if they're if the Haifa pipeline were operative or does that make do you understand what I'm asking like how does that part work there yeah the it's it, <clears throat> both pipelines go through that same node that's that's correct uh, but they wanted to to essentially shut down the uh, the, the export pipeline to to Benias. Uh, and then uh, uh, um, finance minister Netanyahu went to London in June of 03 looking for investment dollars. Now the inv investment dollars would be to, to build a new pump station for a pipeline to, to Haifa and to debottleneck the, uh, the pipeline to Haifa was what, what he was after. Okay, so, but, but in order to get any, any uh, support uh, uh, behind a pipeline to Haifa, first they had to eliminate this pipeline to uh, to Syria, and and the thing about the pipeline to Syria, I remember <clears throat> when you know during during our pre-war planning, we put together um, eight policies that were that were approved by uh, the principals, the, essentially the the cabinet. Uh, and and um, one of the principles that we that we agreed to was there would be no oil infrastructure intentionally bombed attacked during the uh, during hostilities, uh, and and uh, that was all presented to uh, the principals, uh, the Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State, uh, and I'm not sure who else is in that group. Uh, Larry would know better than I. Uh, but they all had had signed off on the fact that there would be no intentional uh, oil infrastructure attack. And then, in in uh, when we were just about ready to to finalize our work in December, the gentleman on our team is, uh, uh, called us all together. Uh, Mikowski, uh Mike Mikowski is the gentleman's name, uh, and he wanted us to reconsider. That policy, he wanted us to make an exception that that we go ahead and bomb that pipeline, eliminate it. And his argument was that uh, that Syria had been helping Saddam smuggle oil outside of the oil for food program, and therefore they needed to be punished. And I remember we were all sitting around the table when Mike presented his case. Well, but, uh, but what about but Glenn, but Mark Rich and Glencore would not deserve to be punished. I would just put that. Well, for, and, for that transgression, <laughs> and and Turkey and Jordan were also involved in some of the smuggling operations. So he he left all that out of the the presentation that he made. But but that that is it. It is he. You know, when he got finished with his presentation, you know, I said, Mike, can I say a, a couple of things? He says, Yeah. And I said, Well, I said I hear you, but I said your argument makes no sense to an oil guy. And he's why is that? And I said, Well, I said the uh, the pipeline is owned, constructed, uh, and operated by the Iraqis. I said, the only thing that Syria gets is a toll fee for using their land and, and their area. And, and uh, so uh, I said, that you're, you'd be punishing the future government of Iraq more than, than, uh, than Syria. And he said, well, how much is that toll fee? And I said, well, I don't know. <clears throat> but I said, in Saudi Arabia, when I was out there, we only paid 26 cents a barrel for uh, crude oil that came uh, across a much longer and much more expensive pipeline than, than this one. And I said, even if it's a dollar a barrel, I said, that's 4% of the, uh, the punishment would go to Syria and 96% would go to, uh, to the future government of Iraq. And everyone in our, in our meeting agreed with me. And so we essentially gave his, his, uh, his request a thumbs down, but we agreed with him. We said, okay, we'll, We'll, we'll make the policy, and in fact, I, I got a copy of the slide in the book that, that said the, the pipeline will remain open or, or closed and used as leverage against government, uh, the, the Syrian government. And that, it, it, and I thought at that point that the thing had gone to bed. And then about four days before I got on a plane to be deployed to Kuwait, Mike came up to me and said, Gary, you need to be in the in the conference room at, uh, at one o'clock today for a, for a conference. So I said, what, what's the subject? And he said, oil. And I said, I said, who's there? And he said, well, Wolf Witz and General Franks. And I said, what, you know, what do we do? Everything's been discussed many times. He says, no, they want, they want to discuss this one more time. So we get up there and, and uh, you know, we spent probably 10 or 15 minutes talking the same old oil policies we had discussed. And then at the end of the, uh, the, 
the uh, meeting. Wolfwitz leans forward in his chair, gets a very serious look on his face, and he looks at General Franks, who was on a, on a VTC out in the cutter at the time, and he said, General, I'll never forget this. I was sitting probably four or five feet away from Wolfwitz. He said, General, when you get into Iraq, I don't want another drop of oil to ever flow on that pipeline to Syria again. He says, do you understand me? And General Franks was on the other end. He gives him a sharp salute, said, I got the mission, sir. And then Wolfwood says, OK, meeting dismissed. And he gets up and storms out of the meeting. And I sat there wondering what the what the hell just happened? Well, I learned a few weeks later when uh, General Bob Creer brought in the pictures of the destroyed pump station to me, what what uh, what he meant by by uh, that order to General Franks. <clears throat> right. So. Uh, Larry Wilkerson, could you explain what this was, your recollection of these events? Were you aware of this kind of controversy and this oil angle at the time that you were there working for uh, right under uh, Secretary of State Powell? And I mean, shouldn't this uh, idea of blowing up this pump against the actual plans and clearly for the benefit of... Uh, uh, of, of of well, I mean, the the combination of that and the inquiries about the Haifa pipeline. I mean, this is this seems like this should be a scandal that the, these facts are coming out. I mean, what do you? What's your recollection of these these oil angles from your time there, and why isn't this a bigger scandal? Well, my biggest recollection, my most vivid recollection, is that everything that Gary just described in detail, Colin Powell knew absolutely nothing about the Secretary of the United States. But it doesn't surprise me one bit that the Deputy Secretary of Defense, without probably the Secretary of Defense's knowledge, issued such an order to the combatant commander, Tommy Franks, who, and let me make this very clear, I think was as dumb as he said Douglas Fyfe was. Only dumb Douglas Fyfe wasn't really dumb. He was just scurrilous. Tommy Franks was from the conversations that Powell had with him. Now, remember, Powell had been chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and he had had Norm Schwarzkopf to deal with during the first Gulf War, and he dealt with him beautifully, and Norm even admitted that afterwards. Franks was an idiot. Um, he should never have had four stars on. He should never have been a unified command commander. Um, I could go into that in great detail, but I won't. Um, and so I, the, the, what Gary just told me doesn't surprise me at all, especially the saluting smartly and going out and doing the mission. Um, not checking at all that any principal, let alone the president of the United States, or even Wolfowitz's boss, Donald Rumsfeld, knew that he'd given that order. That's the way this administration functioned. I go back to my students again. All these little power centers didn't pay any attention to the president of the United States nor the principals committee. They did what they wanted to do when they wanted to do it. And one of the things I'd, I'd like to get Gary to explore a little bit with you, if you're going to ask this question, just shut me up, is Scooter Libby was the lawyer for this arch criminal, <laughs> Mark Rich. Now, Scooter Libby was also the chief of staff to the vice president of the United States. It's my understanding from other sources that Scooter made about four and a half million dollars personally off his lawyering, lawyering for this scoundrel, this crook. Um, and, and we also, we all know that uh, in one of Bill Sapphire, I think, called it the most ignominious act of the presidency, Bill Clinton in the last minute of his second administration, almost as he was walking out the door, pardoned Mark Rich. Now, why did Bill Clinton pardon Mark Rich? Probably in part, at least, if not large part, because Israel helped him beat H.W. Bush for the election that made him president the first time in 92-93. Um, so th this is a whole potpourri of scoundrels who are personally profiting, who are doing what they want to do, are doing some really scurrilous things. And uh, I, I wrote this down today just so I could say this again and again and again every time I get on. According to the Cost of War Project at Brown University, which I've found to be pretty reputable in terms of their, their, their analyses, in the last 20 years, and Iraq is right in the middle of this, the preeminent case, the United States of America has displaced or killed over 45 million people. 
it's killed directly or indirectly 4.5 million. It's displaced internally or externally, which means they have no home. They're either outside their own borders or inside their own borders without a home. 38 million. And in the process of doing that, it spent one trillion taxpayer dollars per year for a total of $21 trillion. And this doesn't even include the massive number of veterans we've created and the VA budget, which used to be 40 billion and now is 340 billion and climbing. This is an incredible thing that the United States has done. It's why the new foreign minister of China said yesterday that the United States has a policy of sanction, of cruelty, of commitment to wars, and if it doesn't get off that track, it is going to derail itself. This is the new foreign minister of China. This is some pretty powerful language now coming out of the other competitor in the world, which is surpassing us in almost every category of real national power. And what are we doing? We're buried in Ukraine. We're buried in Gaza. We're buried in more of what I just described. And these criminals within our government are the people who are doing this. And Mark Rich and Scooter Libby are a perfect example. And I'll just add one other point. I read Valerie Plame's book, Fair Game. The other night I stumbled on Amazon Prime's movie where Sean Penn plays her husband, Ambassador Joe Wilson, and just does a marvelous job. And I started talking to Valerie about it and to see just how valid the movie was. And, this is another thing that Scooter Libby did. Scooter Libby exposed a non-official cover operative for the CIA. And Carl Rove, that wonderful man advising that neophyte, President Bush, is the one who coined that phrase. You know, when he was told that this was a illegal thing to do, he said, no, she's fair again. She's fair again. That's where the title came from. This is an administration, eight years of complete and utter corruption that makes previous administrations, which have been corrupt too at times, look like playboys. Incredible. And most of it happened on my watch in the first term, and it happened because we had a vice president, and to a certain extent linked at the hips with the Secretary of Defense. The vice president was a bureaucratic entrepreneur par excellence. He knew exactly which buttons to push. He knew who to go to, what to go to, how to do it. And the president was a neophyte and didn't have a clue what was going around. Not stupid. Pretty smart guy. I met him twice. Pretty smart guy. I talked to him for 30 minutes in the old office. Pretty smart guy. But he didn't know what was going on in terms of the presidency and how difficult it is to manage that monstrous bureaucracy that we've created and how many smart people he had within that monstrous bureaucracy that knew that and capitalized on it and got what they wanted, like Gary just demonstrated with Paul Wolf was dropping bombs on something that no president even knew he was dropping bombs on. And now look what we're doing. And I just, I got to jump ahead a little bit, Gary, in your book, Gary says, in addition to doing what I did in the preface, uh, talking about all the people we've killed and the money we've spent. He says, quote, our soldiers are protecting the largest illegal international oil smuggling operation in the world today. And they are in Syria. Um, they might have just been kicked off of it. I don't know. I can't verify that with reputable Pentagon sources. They won't talk to me about it. But that's what they're doing in Syria. And they're illegal, as Gary points out, in Syria. They're illegal. The head of state of Syria, recognized by the world, Bashar al-Assad, has not authorized them to be on his soil. So they're illegal. And we are protecting this oil smuggling operation, which is fundamentally for Israel. It doesn't stop. This The story doesn't stop. And it, it's even, it, it ties into some more sordid and horrible aspects of the U.S. Of U.S. foreign policy, because if we, we take this back to like the 1980 uh, Iran-Iraq war, I mean, it seemed the U.S. by many accounts gave Saddam Hussein the green light to attack Iran at that time, you know, and attack this new regime. And they were going to put them in a position where they probably had to, they were desperate for foreign exchange and so on. And so they, and, and there's all these oil sanctions put on them by the U.S. And so they just start selling oil to Israel, which I don't think would have been what they would have wanted to do. 
And then at the same time that this Iraq war is happening, you also have Rumsfeld visiting Saddam Hussein, and then they're taught with discussions about the, the Haifa thing. So it's like that whole war, I would wonder how much that, the U.S. instigating that war and arming both sides, it also had the effect of benefiting Israel's uh, energy interests. And people like Rumsfeld play a part in that. And I, I guess where I could go from that with here is that Libby Cheney nexus, because uh, Gary, you write that you believe that Bush went to war, supported the war in Iraq in part out of some kind of desire to be the macho avenger of his dad, who was allegedly to be assassinated by uh, Saddam Hussein's agents, but that's like a rather dubious case anyway. But you also said, more importantly, and this dovetails with things I've actually done work on, is that H.W. Uh, George W. Bush believed that H.W. Bush lost the election because of his um, breaking with uh, neocon, pro, super Zionist neocons. I mean, which is clear with his uh, at the end of his presidency, or, or I guess during this presidency, really, he c compels Israel to enter into negotiations over a Palestinian state. He says he'll withhold loan guarantees. This is written up in the Jerusalem Times, I believe, uh, or, or one of those m big Israeli newspapers, that this is how George H.W. Bush lost the, is the uh, Jewish vote in the United States, and that this was a lesson for other presidents. But I don't think it was really about the voting people. It was really the lobby and its enormous power. And even somebody like Perot, um, Gary, I don't know if you, if you saw the, my reviews of that episode, and you talk about the Kurdish oil companies that are operating there, or the, the U.S. oil companies in Kurdistan that are probably smuggling oil and making money there and helping to, to supply Israel with cheaper oil. I found out that the, uh, the big American company, the one American company that's over there that I think you mentioned in the book, but I looked it up. It's a it's a HRK Industries or Harkin something, but it's not the Harkin that W is associated with. But it's strange because it's in Texas. But it's actually a Ross Perot company, Ross Perot Jr., which you know you I was I'd been thinking recently that probably the Perot thing had something to do with the Israel lobby because that's always credited for that. But it's such a strange thing that Bush lost, and why do you have this guy doing it? And I and I was guessing like I bet in some way this is like some kind of old you know, Texas oil uh, and Israel lobby connection that was behind this. And then I found this, which is wild. But I, I guess to get more into the politics of Libya and, and, um, and Rich, uh, you know, Cheney in 1992 disagreed with W. Bush about, or H.W. Bush about the, you know, the so-called chicken Kiev speech, you know, about Cold War, post-Cold War strategy, post-Soviet strategy. And Wolfowitz wrote that crazy guideline about basically world domination and preempting anyone who might even challenge the U.S. And H.W. thought they were crazy. And he, and he disagreed over these issues publicly, and they leaked that document. And he disagreed with Cheney, and Cheney was sort of contradicting him in the press even, and Cheney wanted to go all the way to Baghdad in 91. So, for Bush to choose this guy, and for, I, I think, is to be in charge of his vice president search, I mean, I think that supports your, your contention here. Um, do you have anything else to add about this, this angle? Because it seems like W just bent over backwards, and he, listened, he basically listens to Cheney about why his dad lost. And then Cheney brings in Libby, who is essentially this front man for, or a representative of Rich, who is also very close to Mossad on top of everything else. I mean, it, it is, it is so absurdly corrupt. What, do you have any other insights into the, the relationship between the 92 defeat and W's policies? Well, I, I, I don't. There are two, two points I'd like to make. I, <clears throat> Libby, during our our pre-war planning, and I mentioned this in the book, the, uh, we would get, uh, as we were doing individual uh, issues around policy, uh, we, would, we would send this up to Doug Fyth for his, his comments. And, and a couple of times, at least twice, maybe three times, he wrote in the margin, run this by Scooter. And, and when I first got this back, I, you know, I looked at it and I went in to see the, the, the team lead, Mike Mobs, and I said, what's, what's Scooter? I said, is this another uh, classified team here at the Pentagon? He said, oh, no, that's Scooter Libby. He said, we need, I said, why do we need to call the, uh, the guy that works over in the vice? He said, well, because he knows a lot about oil. Well, we did. And, and Scooter did know a lot about oil. 
uh, and, and years later, I found out why. It's because he, as, as Larry correctly said, he made several million dollars in the 1980s working for Mark Rich. And uh, I, I just, I don't remember specifically what those conversations uh, talked about, but the, I know that he impressed me as someone who knew a lot about Middle East oil. Uh, so, and, and he was the guy, uh, I, I mentioned in the book, the uh, uh, Ahmed Chalabi, who, was, who promised the Israel lobby that uh, uh, he would reopen the pipeline. Uh, the, there was a Ch uh, Chalabi, when he was in Baghdad in early summer 2003, had the use of a, uh, uh, a, 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 a secure telephone line. Uh, and, the, uh, and there was a, an army colonel who was assigned to that line to, to, to change the key every day to make sure. And, and the, the, re the reason why they, the primary reason why they had that line was to communicate with the office of the vice president, which is where Scooter Libby was. Okay. Now, the way, the way I found out about that was the the colonel had to leave uh, Baghdad that summer, uh, 2003, because his son had committed suicide, uh, and so that was the talk in Baghdad. And it, what caught my attention was the fact that we had secure uh, communications at that location, uh, supporting Ahmed Chalabi. When I had to use my own credit card to get a uh, a uh, Inmarsat uh, thing into the, the Minister of Oil so that we could sell oil. Uh, I couldn't get any support for communications for the Minister of Oil, but but Ahmed Chalabi had communi secure communications out in Baghdad. That was point number one. The other point that I want to make was the gentleman that I worked with in Baghdad. Uh, he came out in May of 2003, Phil Carroll. Uh, Phil was the retired CEO of Shell US. He was retired chairman of uh, Fluor. And he was a true uh, uh, statesman in the in the oil patch. Uh, everyone in the oil patch knew all the senior executives knew knew Phil Carroll. Well, Phil was also very good friends with George H. and Barbara Bush. Uh, and and that summer, uh, Phil uh, uh, maintained communications with them. Phil Phil did not have an uh, an email assigned to him. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't use the internet. He was old fashioned, everything was, was writing, but he would give a written letter to uh, uh, my, my colleague there in Baghdad and have him type it into an email from my colleague to Barbara Bush, who had a, 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 a cryptic uh, Yahoo account. And it was, it was the conversation that went on between Phil Carroll and George H.W. Bush. And Phil, Phil even mentioned that he blamed uh, the Israel lobby for uh, the fact that George H didn't get reelected in uh, in two thousand in nineteen ninety two. You mean that that in that that George H W Bush himself surmised that, not that Phil surmised that, based well, on well, yes, the yes, or? based on the conversations between Phil and George H, they yeah, they both okay. felt like that that was the reason why he lost the election. Yeah, I, I I completely believe that now. Seeing the way that things unfold, and and I, I think the the Gaza genocide essentially, I think I had some resistance. So I, like I wrote about the American oligarchy, the American deep state, and different factions in, within it that vie for power, and that this is where some of these conflicts like Watergate happen, uh, or the JFK assassination. That there's really a whole level of like high politics, but I didn't. And I always knew about the neocons and the the Israel connection, but I did. It wasn't until really October seven that I the magnitude of the project that that Israel has been engaged in and the character of it became really clear, and the absolutism of it, and this total sense that the the ends justify the means. And your book, because you're not really trying to write it from that perspective, you're really writing about the things that you experienced. It really hammers that home. And to, what's remarkable to me as, as I, I'm talking to you is that uh, it seems that Colonel Wilkerson in the White House was largely, like his office was kept unaware of these, these other angles to a large degree, and it, it, as I understand it. Is that correct? Uh, I mean, you knew that Israel was active here, but were you, to, how has your perspective changed over the you know, decades since then? Well, I, I got misled, if you will, 
I don't know if it was intentional or not as chief of staff when I first took the job because the Israelis who came to town, Mossad, Shin Bet, political types, the ambassador and others, convinced me that they knew we were going to execute a war. This is quite early, going to execute a war against Iraq. We were embedded in Afghanistan at that moment. And they were trying to talk people in Washington, like me, influential on the secretary, if you will, into saying we had the wrong target. Iran was the target. We shouldn't be going to war with Iraq. Well, once they figured out, I think, that we were serious about going to war with Iraq, they shifted their focus entirely. Now, that might have all been psychological warfare on me. I don't know. But all of a sudden, the same people, or new people in most cases, began to advocate for war with Iraq. And I'm, I'm saying all that just because there was this incredible link between Ahmad Chalabi and these Israelis. And one of the incidents that will verify what Gary was saying in spades, I think, about how poisonous this man was and how poisonous was the relationship between him and the vice president and those around the vice president caused Powell to have to exert some really exquisite diplomacy to convince the Hungarians and others in Europe that they should host training facilities and training programs for the massive number of soldiers, essentially, that Chalabi was going to recruit for the war on Iraq. And Powell bought this, hook, line, and sinker, and, and he put his diplomats to work and himself to work on convincing capitals in Europe that this was serious and we wanted to do it. And Cheney was behind this whole hog. There were going to be, according to Chalabi and Cheney and Scooter, there were going to be 700 people per complement going into, ultimately, Hungary was the only country that would provide the facilities and the secrecy um, each month. And this was well before the war actually started, about a year before, as a matter of fact. And they were going to be trained and they were going to be ready to go into Iraq with the U.S. forces that went in there and any other coalition of the willing forces we could get. Why my boss didn't smell that for the rat it was, was sort of interesting for me because I knew he had gotten rid of Chalabi. And what do I mean by that? The State Department had been responsible for Chalabi and his Iraqi National Congress. We had been funding him. Um, the U.S. had been funding him, but through state's coffers. We were so disgusted with this man who was driving around in London in Mercedes, rental cars, lease cars, having big parties and things, wasn't doing squat that really mattered, was enjoying the money he was getting. So we divested ourselves of him. We couldn't get rid of him. We wanted to get rid of him entirely. We wanted the government to get rid of him entirely. But DOD took him over. And so they, they, they began to manage him. And that meant the vice president had a direct line into him. Well, guess what happened when it came time for these battalions to actually mount helicopters and fly into Iraq with the troops that were going into Kuwait? There was less than one battalion. That's all Chalabi could muster. Why people didn't understand that this guy was a complete charlatan, a fake, and couldn't do anything really substantial that was positive for the security of America, but was doing all manner of things that were dispositive or negative for the security of America is beyond me. But the vice president covered him. The vice president and Fife and others like him, the neoconservative Scooter Libby, covered him. He was he was their savior. He was going to be the ruler of Iraq. And that was going to benefit Israel, of course, completely, because he'd be favorable to Israel and Iraq would suddenly. The country, arguably speaking, prior to Iran's rise to this position, concerned Israel more than any other. Um, and so he was going to turn it over to Israel, essentially, through his own leadership. How these people bought that is beyond me. How my boss, Colin Powell, bought that is beyond me. I don't think he completely bought it, but he went along with it. And, you know, Sam Huntington, in his book, The Clash of Civilizations, I believe this is where he writes this, but he writes that Iraq, because of its water supply and the fact that it has functional agriculture, which, of course, it has for millennia, right? Um, that it was the one country that actually posed a threat to U.S. hegemony in the region and I think from the neocon perspective, if you allow Iraq to just sell its oil on the international markets 
and act as a normal economy, then they would have the basis of constructing a, a, a fairly wealthy and advanced society that would make it more difficult for Israel to do things that it's doing now, like try to go for this final solution to the Palestinian question. So, I mean, I, it's it, it seems like it was doing this was win, win, win from the perspective of these hardline neoconservatives who wanted uh, basically a U.S., Israeli, Western Im Empire, Uberales forever, right? And greater Israel and so on. Yeah, most people forget that in the Levant, in 1990, uh, Iraq was probably the most advanced country. Women had rights that they didn't have elsewhere. Um, colleges were teaching people liberal arts. There, there was a, a, a real life going on in Iraq. Saddam Hussein was a tyrant, no question about that. Uh, but tyrants had been there for a long time, thanks to the British, at least initially. Um, but Iraq was the leading country in the region with Israel probably being the only other competitor. Israel's doing the same thing to Lebanon, and they're trying to finish Lebanon off right now because they don't want a competitor at the eastern end of the Mediterranean or anywhere close to them, and Iraq was too close for comfort. So they've gotten rid of Iraq. They're getting rid of Lebanon. I think they're probably going to finish that task within the next month or two. Uh, I think it's going to bring Israel to its knees. But nonetheless, what you've just described has been U.S. complicit strategy for a long time. And it, it, it really is not in the U.S. interest. And when you think of H.W. Bush and even Reagan recognizing the PLO at the end of his term, there are people who are more, much, much more conservative than me and really favor U.S. imperialism, I would argue. But they were sensible about it. I think they figured yeah. you could allow these oil con exporting countries to do business, buy their oil, they'll, their oligarchs will become rich enough and so connected to the dollar system that they'll want to stay with it and things can run you know, smoothly with America managing global capitalism and the oil countries being rich enough and prosperous enough that they're okay with the arrangement. I mean, that seems to be more of like what H.W. Bush was favoring, and and creating a Palestinian state was one way to secure American interests in there, and that seems sensible to me. And I'm not really a fan of H.W. Bush or his, uh, you know, it's just he represents the CIA and old oil money and Wall Street and some really sinister covert operations of the early Cold War era. I mean, I'm in no way a fan of the of the him or agree with him politically or morally, but he was sensible about. U.S. imperial or rational, let's say, he was rational about U.S. imperialism. This seems to be so detrimental to U.S., even the interests of U.S. imperialism, which I don't support in any way, shape, or form. This seems not even to correspond to any logic except for an insane kind of eschatological logic. Of course, I disagree with you with H.W. Bush. I think H.W. Bush was the last experienced president we had. Uh, I, looked I don't, I don't disagree with you there. Well, I, I agree I, with I looked, you on that. I looked at him as uh, I, everything you said, but I looked at those things as more or less positives because he brought the incredible experience that one needs to run an empire the size of ours to the Oval Office, the last person to do so. Every president since H.W. Bush has been a neophyte, uh, an eloquent neophyte like Obama was, but even his eloquence got us into trouble. When I met with President Obama in the Roosevelt Room in the last year of his administration, he was literally crying in his milk over what he'd done in Libya. He had dispatched Samantha Power to be the UN ambassador at the United Nations to get rid of her. And he had essentially put John Kerry in his place with regard to what Kerry was advocating for Syria, troops on the ground in Syria. And he despised Hillary Clinton. I'm quite confident of that because he saw her and Samantha getting him into the Libya fiasco, which he would have revisited in a heartbeat if he could. But he didn't have the experience. When he told Jeffrey Goldstein, when he told us that day that there's a bias in Washington toward war, he was speaking the truth. From his perspective, he understood that. I never thought I'd hear an American president say something like that. But he realized what was happening to him, finally, at the end of his two administrations. Um, and Joe Biden, who should have been very experienced, has been anything but. And I think part of it because of his senility. But we are a warmongering state now. There's no question about it. And we are perched right now 
in the heart of Europe, supporting a country that has completely and utterly lost. It's only a matter of time before Zelensky heads for his Dasha or he's assassinated and they do something else in Ukraine. It's over. It's finished. The Russians have won, so to speak. They lost a lot. They lost some 200,000 soldiers in the process, but Ukraine probably lost twice that amount. And in Gaza, what's the death toll in Gaza? Ralph Nader's right. The death toll in Gaza is north of 200,000, not the 40,000 that keeps getting reported. It's north of 200,000. The military has a, 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 a template you take. The template takes into consideration terrain, weaponry use, uh, people, density, all the things that you need to predict casualties. That template shows that at least 180,000 are dead in Gaza already. It's lies that the media is telling and that Hamas is even telling. Hamas doesn't want this total to come out either because they don't want the people remaining alive in Gaza to know how many of them have been killed, women, children, and such. Um, and we're we're in this. We're in this big time. And for the life of me, I cannot ferret out the reason that we stick to Israel with such an alacrity and such cohesiveness and adhesiveness as we do. Only now are we finally saying things. Finally, the Central Command Command went to Israel twice. He had to go a second time to make sure they understood him and made sure it was coming from the White House and told him we wouldn't be with, told Netanyahu we wouldn't be with him if he attacked Hezbollah and we won't be with him if he attacks Iran categorically told him that. So we're finally in a position here where Netanyahu is in real deep trouble. And I don't know how he's going to play it, but I fear that he might play it adversely to what common sense would dictate. Um, because it's his life. He's going to prison. Um, and he might go to prison with a special imprimatur on it uh, if there is a real investigation of October the 7th. But that's where we are now. And it's all started with the defeat of H.W. Bush and the imbeciles, and I don't use that term loosely, who followed him in the Oval Office for various reasons. Right. So let me just throw this out there and uh, uh, let me see if you concur with this or, or, or not. Um, that H.W. Bush, George H.W. Bush, uh, he tried to accommodate these forces. He's really there at the aftermath of Watergate. And for a time, he was about to defend uh, and call a press conference about this other blackmail angle to uh, to the Watergate case that was the, the, they were going to use to try to defend Nixon. And then the day they call they're going to call this press conference, the congressman who I think his name was Leon, his last name was Leon, and he just dies of a heart attack that day. And it, it, the denouement of Watergate, you know, you is very strange or whatever, but the aftermath of it, you basically have a kind of neocon presence in the White House that wasn't really there before. Uh, Gerald with Rumsfeld and Cheney there, and H.W. Yep. Bush is the CIA director, and he creates Team B, which basically set lays some of the groundwork for the big defense buildup by exaggerating Soviet capabilities. And so a lot of people, like, I thought for a while that H.W. Bush was more or less part of that neocon milieu, but then I learned more that he um, later clashed with these people, called them the crazies, he opposed uh, those the neocons like Wolfowitz and Cheney, even as he was president, but he accommodated them. He had he to accommodate not, them with I Team B, he, he had to he accommodate did. them with the Gulf War, I think. Yeah, I think and, he despised them. And if you yes. remember how he got Cheney, he got Cheney because Towers was uh, re reputed by his own Senate. He right. Knew Towers, John Towers. And John, yeah. and John Tower is a guy who, I, he interviewed James Angleton back in the church committee, and he gets into the Israel angle and the Israel account angle, and it's it's really something. It's, a, it's really like John Tower and those Bush people had a similar view, I believe, of the role of Angleton and the and the Israel account in some of these events, like he even gets into the Kennedy assassination and the mob ties and everything. So there's this whole backstory there. But however it was, the neocons and the Israel lobby acquired so much power that people like George H. W. Bush accommodated them as CIA director. He had to deal with them. He brought Israel into the Iran Contra affair and made them a part of the clandestine state. I later think that they used that to kind of blackmail them in different ways. So it, there's reason to believe that Israel may have been responsible for some of the Iran Contra scandal, which now that you think about it would make 
perfect sense because it's so strange that Congress was like all of a sudden up in arms about foreign policy law breaking, which is when did we ever stop that? You know, and Reagan was doing things like selling F-15s and AWACS to Saudi Arabia. Yes, and that and the Israel lobby did not like that. I think that that is a key part of this: is that the Israel lobby is more intertwined in the clandestine netherworld, which also deals with the drug traffic, which is extremely lucrative. I think that this goes back to Meyer Lansky, really, in some ways. And then in Watergate era, Lansky yeah. they they go after Lansky, and Lansky flees to Israel un until it's safe to come back because Nixon's been hobbled, basically. But then you get, a, let's fast forward to Obama. Obama's not a neocon. He defeats the real neocon um, McCain, but he still accommodates the neocon project of regime change that Wesley Clark elucidated. You know, he, he, th they use the Arab Spring, which in retrospect seems like a big, you know, kind of CIA operation, basically. And it's a pretext to uh, perfect for continuing the war in Libya and then Syria. So even Obama... And Obama goes along with the Maidan coup, even though I don't, I don't think he really thought that was smart either. So nobody, people try to accommodate these forces, but always they have that much power, but it's always disastrous. I so, remember. Go ahead. Uh, I remember reading a cable, actually several cables that stunned me at the time. They were from our chief of station in the Middle East, as it were, because he was between Beirut. Riyadh, several other places. He, he had a C-47 dedicated to him to fly all around the region because he was chief of station in a bunch of countries. <laughs> and he said, he said, this is right after the war. He sent this cable back essentially saying, repudiating, repudiating the White House, the intelligence services and everybody else and saying, listen, folks, I'm here, you're there. The number one enemy in this region is not the Soviet Union post World War II. It's Britain. Yeah, that, they, they, they are intertwined there. And it has a lot to do with the history that we're, you know, just roughly covering here in the Levant. It has a hell of a lot to do with it, from borders to leaders to nefarious happenings. Incidentally, this individual sent several cables like that back um, on a passage from, I think, if I recall right, he was flying from Beirut to Tunisia or something like that, and his plane exploded and crashed. Wait, who is this here? Who's the person you're referring to? Is, is, this, is, this, is this Charlotte Dennett's father? It, it, this guy was, uh, he was a real, he was, you know, kind of a, a Bill Donovan type, but with a brain. Yeah, uh, and, and he was left in that region after the detritus of war filtered down. You know, yeah. World War II was ended, and we were beginning to get a little contentious with Joe Stalin, and and all, all the emphasis for him as chief of station in three or four different countries yeah. was essentially on the Soviets, and he just he said back. It ain't the Soviets we need to be concerned about, not yet anyway. It's the British <laughs> because right. they're, trying, they're trying to maintain their <laughs> empire and they know we are the ones who might supplant them. Right. I think that may be Charlotte Dennett's father, and she wrote a book on that called Follow the Pipelines that deals with her investigation into this death. And Gary actually cites her work uh, at one point, or at least mentions her name. And I've interviewed her here before. It's it is and the, the british i think the british and the zion you know the the zionists they they need they need the u.s to really be the one and only power like they were they're they're both of their economies and countries are not really prosperous on their own with their own resource endowments and so on at this point that they they need this they need yeah, the u.s to be fortress america with the dollar i don't think london came fully to that realization though till 56 when Eisenhower did what he did. Yeah. Um, and, and, and Israel of course was involved in that too. And, and, and if you read the history of it, you know that Israel lingered and lingered and lingered. And he finally had to tell them, I'm, I'm going to do something to you. You're not going to like, if you don't get your ass out of Suez. Cause the French and the British left pretty much as he uh, brought the pressure to bear, but the Israelis tried to hang around for weeks. Yeah. And, you know, if you read the Angleton Church Committee testimony with John Tower doing the questioning, he says that in 1956, 
it, there's a Penthouse Magazine article written by Ted Schultz, who was a, a good reporter, but you had to write these things in Penthouse, apparently, that it was reported, the article reported that in 56, the U.S. administration somehow gave Israel the green light and said it would help them to get nuclear weapons. But there's a question, it was like, well, was that really a U.S. policy or was that Angleton and maybe Dulles just sort of agreed that like, okay, we'll do this because of, to, as a sort of sop for the Suez crisis. So, there's that angle as well. Oh, and by the way, two guys that really clashed with Angleton and the, you know, and it dealt with the exposure of the Israeli account, John Tower and William Colby, they both die in really weird ways in the 90s. So, <laughs> add that uh, also mm -hmm. to the story. But I think if I could take this back to Gary. Um, Look, I, can I ask Gary ahead. a question before you do? Uh, sure. I just, I, I just want to find out if he knows precisely um, what is happening in Syria right now from his oil perspective. What What is happening to that group of oil facilities that apparently we were there to guard and yeah, they the only uh, <clears throat> the inf information I have is probably a few months old, Larry. Uh, I haven't heard anything just recently, but but uh, but we we do still have troops there. They are still in harm's way, uh, and and uh, I'm hearing uh, things about what you said that uh, between the Russians and the uh, the Syrians, they want to re retake take back that the, those oil wells. And uh, and that oil does belong to Damascus. It does not belong to the the Syrian Kurds. And, and you rightfully said that uh, we are supporting a large smuggling operation. In fact, it's probably the largest smuggling operation in the world right now. Roughly forty thousand barrels a day. We're going from uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, Syrian Kurdish area to the Iraqi Kurdish area. And my contact said that it was going to one specific refinery in um, in Erbil that would take that oil, refine it into products, and then move the products to wherever they could sell it, the, the gasoline and diesel and whatnot. But that enabled, when, when they did that, Iraqi Kurdistan had been suffering from lower production rates over the last year or two. And, and by getting that oil to that refinery, that was... 40,000 barrels a day less that the Kurds sent to that refinery. So that was 40,000 barrels a day more that they could export uh, to people like Glencore and Trafigura, uh, and, and it could go to, uh, to Israel. Now, the, the question becomes, when, <clears throat> when, when did the, the pipeline uh, uh, to um, Chehan stop? And I think that was, that was about a year ago uh, or so, um, you know, let me mention to uh, uh, to Aaron. You know, this book was that I, I finished was actually writ written about a year ago. Unfortunately, my wife had a bad accident that put everything on hold for about nine months. Uh, but the uh, uh, when it was written, uh, there, to my knowledge, there was still oil going to Chehan and, and still going to uh, to Israel from uh, from uh, uh, Iraqi Kurdistan. But where it's going today, Larry, I'm not sure. I, I I've reached out to a couple people, and they're not they're not sure either. Right, and the whole pretext of our being there is ISIS. But it, it's uh, my understanding is that in Iraq, for example, I think Patrick Cockburn wrote this in like the Independent or some you know mainstream source. He wrote that if you go to Iraq and you ask any person on the street, they will say that ISIS is CIA. Um, but you're right. That is our pretext because, and Larry can vouch for this. I I was not not at the level at the Pentagon he was, but if if our orders to our troops was to go out there and smuggle oil out of that's an illegal order, and our troops would never obey such an order. But if you tell them you're going out there to to uh, protect or, or to uh, to get rid of ISIS, then that's a legal order. I guess we can keep troops in our, in Syria for that. But to smuggle oil out out of Sy Syria, that's an illegal oil. Uh, order and there are roughly a, a thousand troops out there. That ninety percent of what they do is to help the Syrians smuggle that oil. <clears throat> and the, the, Iraqi, the Iraqi Prime Minister, I think, has just put the lie to to it. Uh, soft words, so to speak, but nonetheless, coming from the Iraqi Prime Minister, we can handle ISIS. <laughs> yeah, that's what he said. <laughs>
I, yeah, I, I it, the whole thing is absurd, especially when you consider that the leader, military leader most responsible for defeating ISIS, the U.S. Not, assassinated him, mm. perhaps in part out of anger with him for defeating ISIS. <laughs> but we'd have to <laughs> speculate about that. I, I, what is strange to me or, or shocking to me now is that the narratives that they put in place around the Iraq war, which I always was against from the beginning and thought it was brazenly illegal, but it made it it withstood more scrutiny than what we're doing today like what we're doing today is now so clearly just brazenly illegal but it's almost like any one of the illegal things that we're doing like overthrowing ukraine's government or uh in, invading syria and occupying its land and with a obviously ridiculous pretext of fighting isis i mean these are not it's just so brazenly like they're just lying as they pursue criminal imperialist practices is this you all have more experience watching politics uh, and history in the u.s than me is this a new level of just like uh, where, where it's not even that the the, the propaganda is even persuasive anymore it's just this is how it is it's the top down they're just telling us what reality is and it it's totally made up but we just don't have any recourse well You've got a secretary of state who stands up and pontificates about the atrocities and authoritarianism, et cetera, that goes on in Myanmar or the deaths that are going on in Sudan or elsewhere and says nothing about, as I indicated, I think Ralph Nader's right, 200,000 deaths in Gaza. With our bombs, our bullets, our bayonets, our billions, um, how can you be such a hypocrite? How can you stand up and be such a hypocrite? Well, apparently Tony Blinken has no difficulties whatsoever. Right. I mean, uh, your ex from your experience in the oil industry, uh, Gary, do you feel that the people that have been watching, you know, because oil is quite intertwined with politics, obviously, um, as your former co-workers and superiors were friendly with the, the Bush family, for example, that, that shows that. But... Is there a sense among the people that you know who are establishment people that this whole thing has gone off the rails? And I mean, what is what do you hear from people that you used to know and work with about these things? Yeah, it's it's mixed. There there are some people who truly are interested in in, in studying, reading uh, former oil executives that I still play golf with who uh, truly are interested in the truth and and. Uh, and they would agree with uh, with both you gentlemen uh, on uh, what you're stating. And uh, they're a bit frustrated with our government right now, uh, frustrated in, in that all they see are lies coming out of uh, out of the government. Uh, you know, why do we pay these uh, public affairs people to lie to us? You know, the uh, uh, is is the comment I get. Then there are other people in the oil industry who've retired who are just happy being re retired at this point. But uh, yeah, I think. I'd, it's a mixed bag. <clears throat> yes, I, I just look for signs of some sort of mind, mind, I don't say mindfulness, but like some sort of, that there's some kind of minding of, of reality going on in higher circles. And uh, I guess if eventually it got clear to, it was made clear to Biden that you, you've talked about this in other appearances, that he cannot, if he escalates, by shooting, allowing the shooting of missiles into Russia, deep into Russia, that this would lead to missiles being fired at Western targets. And that finally, it seems that they've, they, according to your sources, Larry, if I remember you correctly, this is something that's been finally conveyed to Biden. And, they, and I believe you said that it, it came from a, came as a shock to Biden to actually understand this, which is like something that I, that you or I would have understood for quite some time. So how is the president well, so the most, detached? You know, the most dramatic thing I've heard, and I've had it confirmed by two alternate sources that don't talk to each other usually, is that they've had to turn both theaters of war, in Gaza and Ukraine, over to the Pentagon. And that Lloyd Austin, once that was done, finally found his own courage. And he's convinced, rightfully so in my view, that the president, that Putin is dead serious, that a 32,000 kilometer per hour, do the math, 
That's about 19,000 miles per hour. Missile with a warhead that its explosion is the equivalent of a five or six KT tactical nuclear weapon without the radioactivity and other effects would hit NATO capitals, including Washington and London. And they have finally figured out that Putin is not bluffing. And so the whole account in both instances, in both theaters has been turned over to the Pentagon. That's what I'm hearing. And the fury on Biden's part, I think must have indicated either his senility or which is a possibility or the fact that people have been lying to him like Jake Sullivan and Tony Blinken and others, and p perhaps even Lloyd Austin had not been telling him the full truth until the military leaders, the service chiefs told him the full truth, which was essentially in Ukraine that Russia has won and that Putin is not bluffing. That, and, Larry, the fact that you say that that's, that's reassuring. When you said that on another podcast here a day or two ago, you know, I, 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 you know, that's great news to me that, that finally Lloyd Austin is stepping forward and showing some leadership in, in this administration. And, and, and certainly it's going to be military officers at the Pentagon who are going to, going to take note of this. Uh, because from what I've seen, the people at the State Department, the Foreign Service officers live in an alternative world. They, they don't, they've been lied to so much that they, they think the lies are, are, are reality. But I, it, it, it sounds like the people at the Pentagon are, are, are stepping up. They're, they're showing some leadership. And that's, that's really good to hear. I think that's happening. And as you well know, and I know, it's because they're going to die if, if they have to go fight these, these conflicts themselves. And it's not a fair fight, really, because it's been set up. It's been set up for their initial defeat if if it turns out to be the way that we're talking about um you know there's i i think the chinese foreign minister said it as as well as i could possibly say it he he essentially said our rhetoric is hypocrisy our rhetoric is the exact opposite of what we're doing that if we don't stop it there aren't sufficient guardrails to keep us from crashing I mean, that's a rough translation of the Chinese. That's really powerful language coming from a country that in all manners of power now equals us. And some even probably surpasses us. Um, you had a guy yesterday. Um, who was it? Oh, it's Kevin Rudd, ambassador of Australia to the United States, former prime minister of Australia, um, Mandarin speaker. Uh, probably has read everything Xi Jinping's read. I mean, he really knows China well. He said 20 years ago, they had this many ships and we had this many ships. Now it's the other way around. Only thing Kevin missed was he didn't count quite rightly. He was talking about 300 and 200 in their surface fleet and our surface fleet and subsurface fleet. The Chinese have 5,000 armed fishing boats. <laughs> <clears throat> They have the largest fishing fleet in the world by a factor of 20 or 30 to 1. They have over 50,000 ships that ply the oceans and fish. They have 10,000 that ply the deep seas and fish. And many of those, like I said, about 5,000 of them are armed. Ask the Filipinos who from their little patrol boat for their Coast Guard have looked up 30 feet at the deck of a Chinese fishing boat armed to the teeth and said, well, yeah, we'll move off this reef. Um, the balance of power is shifting, and it's shifting partly because we're asleep. We're, we're just asleep, and we're pursuing all these stupid policies that distract us from what is our real security threat in the world. Right. I mean, it, it was recently, maybe a year, maybe two years ago, sometimes time kind of flies by, but Xi Jinping and uh, or other high Japanese officials came out and spoke about the need in their own economy. They said, we must crack down on profiteering in the education, uh, health care and housing sectors, because this is a drain on the on boosting consumption as we want to do in this country. And it's making, you know, this is not these people are sort of parasitic. Right. But then you think about the U.S., and those are like basically lobbies of, of money, organized money, and you cannot even think about trying to cut out rent seeking in education, healthcare, and housing. 
we we bird and and not even just because I think it's not even just because of the people who make all that money racketeering in those sectors. I believe that back in the after the '60s happened, the right the oligarchs of the U.S. said, you know, the people are too comfortable. There's too much middle class prosperity, and they're protesting. If we just put everyone in debt and make everything really expensive, no one can leave their jobs and no one can really participate politically. Like, I think that's part of what they've done in the U.S. So China is thinking, like, how can we let our citizenry live it up to its potential and become the best scientists or, or do whatever they, they, they want to do to be, you know, to have productive lives? And in, in the U.S., they're thinking, like, we better not allow our people to be too comfortable or too well-educated or so on because then they might actually start thinking that they should have some say in the way things work or anything else. I mean, how can we, how can we, the U.S., compete with countries that are actually trying to improve the lives of their citizenry and, and allow them to live up to their potential, and we just intentionally kind of make it really difficult for people to survive unless they are really good at, at, at working for a business in, in a particular way? I mean, this, it just seems our whole civilization has come this, this way and it's so obvious that we're we're in a, a blind alley that's that has nowhere good to go, and yet we can't do anything about it. And I don't know how. I don't think anybody know. I think we're all watching how this is going to play out. But there's got to be some change coming soon. Uh, it, what, what do you have to? Maybe a Larry. I'll ask. I'll, I'll kick that to you. And if you have anything to add, Gary, you can add that, and then we'll talk about where people can get your book. But maybe I'll just close with this because the corruption that we've been talking about is so systemic. And, and it, it's, when you think about it, it's like, well, look at how bad everything else is in this country. It actually is not that surprising, even if it's totally shocking at the same time. Where, where, do we, where does this go, Larry? Larry Wilkerson? I don't know, but I got to go. <laughs> okay. Uh, Gary Vogler, do you have any, any last words? And where, where's the best place for people to get your book? Because it's, uh, it, it's really, uh, uh, people, you have to read it. People have to read it. It's extremely useful. <laughs> it's on, it's on Amazon. Uh, and you could get it. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's being sold on Amazon right now. Uh, uh but, uh, if you know me, I, I'll, I'll sign a copy for you. Larry's got a signed copy from me. The, uh, that's out there. It's been out there since May. Uh, yeah, Gary, and then my, go ahead. Gary, Gary just sent me a box load. I'm going to take them down to the conference <laughs> in Washington and put them on the table for books. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's punchy. It's like the whole thing, it's short, but there's nothing in it that's filler. I've never really summarized most of a whole book before on, on podcasts. So I really recommend it. And uh, I thank you both for staying uh, over time here. It's been a really illuminating conversation. I will try to uh, recommend your book to other people who have podcasts so you can promote it, uh, Gary, because I think people really need to read it. Uh, thank you. But thank you, gentlemen, both so much for being here today. Thank, thank you, Larry. Yeah. Take care of yourself, Gary. All right. You too, Larry. <laughs>